Hey, it's Heather, Business Development Lead from Cooperatives First. This webinar, How to Be Successful at Economic Development Without Blowing the Budget, was recorded on May 11th, 2022. I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Kyle. And the meeting is being recorded today. And some of our friends um, wanted to join, but were not able to today. And so we will be recording the meeting. Um, and once again, yeah, keep those, uh, keep those intros going in the chat. It's nice to see everyone uh, today. And if this is your first event with Cooperatives First, welcome. Um, we are a business development organization that promotes and supports cooperative businesses in Western Canada. We do this through the support of our funder, who's Federated Cooperatives Limited. Um, it's a network of cooperative retails in Western Canada. And if you're working with a co-op or, you know, if you're curious how a co-op might work, um, get in touch, check out our website or online resources. Even if you're not in Western Canada, um, we've got lots of things for people around the world. We've got courses, um, webinars, we've got blogs and podcasts, lots of things. So um, it, we can provide direct support if you're starting a co-op in Western Canada. And if you're not, check out our resources. So that's cooperativesource.com or you could check out coopcreator.ca or .com and that has free tools and resources for people starting co-ops. So. Kyle, do you want to spotlight a video of our speakers and me? Welcome, Deb and Becky. Uh, you may have heard we have some special guest speakers today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Deb, Deb Brown and Becky McRae. So Deb and Becky are the co-founders of Savior.town. And Savior.town gives people small practical steps they can put into action right now to create a better future. They do this through their newsletters, videos, speaking engagements, blogs, toolkits. I need to take a breath in the middle, as well as in-person online vote support. The central idea of Savior.town is your town can be successful by being open to new ideas. So they've actually developed the idea friendly method, which is just a three-step easy to use um, way to make new ideas happen. So that's together, um, but individually, they also have their um, own successful projects and organizations, small business survival and building possibility, and as well as various entrepreneurial ventures, including farming, ranching, insurance, owning a liquor store. Okay, so there's a lot of diversity in there and being uh, uh, leading a chamber of commerce as well. So, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, so yeah, audio, yeah. Yeah, we, um, many, so, okay, the reason I wanted to bring Deb and Becky in to talk to us about cheap ECDEB or, you know, expense, inexpensive, how to do this without blowing the budget is that I know from talking to many economic developers that a lot of the projects they're working on are multi-year, high budget, high on planning, and sometimes those could be hard to see those rewards and uh, those wins and celebrate those wins as you go, because it can just feel, um, it just feels like a long-term thing, which are so important. Um, but, you know, if you only do those long term projects, it can be hard to feel like you're really getting those wins and those kind of good feelings. Um, so, you know, sort of in order to kind of counteract that or build this into, you know, something else for you to do, um, I invited them to talk about how to do projects that are inexpensive, easy to start, you know, low on budget, low on, you know, just doable. Um, and I thought, who better than Deb and Becky to talk to us about this prop, about those kinds of ideas. Um, so this is going to be the end of me. I want to welcome Deb and Becky. Thank you for joining us today. And the stage is yours, so take it away. Thank you so much. Let me hit share screen and we'll get going. All right, Deb. Well, hi, I'm Deb Brown, and I come to you from the land to the Iowa. The Iowa people are of Sioux stock and closely related to the Oto and Missouri tribes. And this land is now the state of Iowa. I'm Becky McCray and I'm in the Northwest part of what is now called Oklahoma. At one time, the Cherokee outlet. And before that, it was the home of the Comanche, Kiowa and Wichita people, all native nations that happen to now be headquartered here in Oklahoma. So you're going to want to make a note or grab a screenshot. You want this website. You can download a copy of these slides for your reference at savior.town slash budget. And we will put that link in the chat box. It should be there. And I'll keep it up on the next couple of slides as well. We started with over 100 inexpensive and practical ideas for doing economic development on a shoestring budget and shaping a better future for your town. Well, we cut it down to just the best 45 or so for today. 
please don't try to make notes of all of them. Listen for the idea that gets you excited. One that matches up with your big idea for your community. And that's the one to write down. Also, as mentioned, please feel free to put your reactions in the chat. If a sentence or idea really connects with you, type it back in the chat so we know what's resonating for you. That also helps reinforce those ideas for everyone and put your questions for us in there as well. We'll do our best to answer them personally during the Q&A time at the end. And thank you, Heather, for helping us keep track of those questions. Becky, you ready? Start us off. Let's begin by looking at some ways to start tiny businesses that don't require huge investments. You can lower the barrier to entry for your entrepreneurs, let them test out their ideas, see if they work and create more excitement around new businesses. You want more tiny businesses to get tried so you can find the most promising ones to grow. Now, um, the first few ideas here will be about expanding the places that your tiniest business startups can make sales and grow. The Pueblo of Zuni, New Mexico had a lot of local people making traditional crafts and arts, but very few usable commercial buildings for them. To support their artists in growing their business, they created an outdoor market area in an empty lot and started a series of arts and crafts market events. The artists reached more customers together than at these temporary events than they would have on their own. So this is easy to start in any town. Take an empty lot, pick a weekend, and have your local crafters, artists, and entrepreneurs sell from pop-up booths. Hi, Ness. Augusta, Pennsylvania, population 483, lost an entire block of downtown buildings to a fire. And that lot sat empty for 10 years. No one business was coming in to save their town. Then the Industrial Development Board had a bright idea. They decided to try something different. Lots of tiny businesses. Get this, they put garden sheds on that empty block and added facades to match the downtown buildings. This block became known as the Tyanesta Market Village. Each shed is home to a business that rents the space for about $50 a month. There is a bakery that expanded from another town and the winery out in the country has a second location here. You'll find a woman who makes dock clothes, a man who sells hand-tied flies for the people who fish. There's a barbecue place, an artist retail space, a candle shop and more. This market gives your lo their local entrepreneurs the chance to try out their business ideas and test their market. Now, they've also incubated new local businesses, like a pair of local pottery makers who were one of the first to rent a shed, and they've since outgrown it, and they've moved into a larger garage in town. Our next business idea is business inside a business. This is really simple to start. Just walk into any existing retail business and ask if they'll dedicate one wall for another local business to decorate with something for sale. Now this image, this is a coffee shop in Minnesota and they asked a local photographer who worked from their home to display their work on an empty wall. In Gosstown, New Hampshire, local artists have joined together to put art on the walls inside existing businesses and they also pop up a temporary gallery inside of the empty buildings. I love that idea. Deb, I love that. What Goffstown, New Hampshire calls their art on the walls project is art on the walls. <laughs> so <laughs> keep things simple. Okay. While you're looking at those places that are retail businesses to do art on the walls or business inside a business, also look inside your service businesses. Look inside your nonprofits, your museums, your government buildings, any other places that are open to the public. If there is room to put a shelf, you can turn that into another business. Now, this shelf of locally produced foods is actually inside of the Chickasaw Nation Cultural Center in Sulphur, Oklahoma. And our next idea brings your hidden businesses out to uh, new opportunities to sell and network. And Michelle Robles from Ohio helped put together a business showcase specifically for home-based and rural businesses that were unknown to most people. And they held it in an empty building downtown. And Michelle told us the seed of the concept was a local business owner who needed a custom hose for a piece of equipment. He had to drive 17 miles to the closest city 
and uh, for them. And then he found out that there's actually a small business in a rural area just two miles away that could actually make them cheaper. <laughs> and he had no idea they were there. So that's why they brought all those home-based businesses out for this. Now, the unexpected bonus of this was by showcasing these hidden businesses all together in one location, they started building connections. And that resulted in the creation of at least two new businesses in town for Michelle. These next few ideas are about getting your potential businesses the resources they need to start or grow. Norfolk County, Ontario added a formal networking exercise at their economic development and tourism meeting. Now attendees were able to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with anyone else who would be there. And interestingly enough, people asked for meetings even with people they already knew. They weren't looking for an introduction. They were looking for a time to make a pitch or open a conversation about a future project. You know, even people who run into each other around town may not get that chance to start a deeper conversation because, you know, the post office often isn't the right place to ask about earning someone's business. Organizer Clark Hoskin told us that people found new jobs during that exercise and one person made a connection that led to a new business. Cassandra Boniface with the Township of Sterling Rodden, Ontario, told us about their new spin on the Business Resource Night. This is where you showcase your resources for business owners or those just thinking of owning a business. Rather than making the entrepreneurs sit through boring presenta presentations by all the resource people there, instead they set up casual booths with comfy chairs. The whole thing was an informal way for participants to connect in a relaxed environment. Now, in another example, several partners in Iowa decided they wanted more entrepreneurs. So they held an informal gathering called Entre Bush. <laughs> Entre Bash, I'll get it yet. Round tables were set up so you could visit with the experts personally. The young Hispanic couple in this picture, they were meeting with the Small Business Development Center and they have since started their own greenhouse business. Now, the next ideas we're going to share are more about your makers and crafters. These are your tiny manufacturers. So how many of your potential entrepreneurs have a garage-sized business idea? They just don't have a usable garage or they don't own a house or they can't afford to buy a house just to get a garage to get started. So in Twists, Washington, which is population about 1500 people, they converted a former forest ranger station into spaces for local businesses. And the one you see in the picture is the old equipment shed. And they wondered for a long time what to do with it. What they're doing now is they're slowly converting it into small shop garage size spaces. One at a time as they are rented, they add the fronts and the doors. And right now they are rented to a local craft entrepreneurs like a blacksmith and a conservation birdhouse maker who makes birdhouses for specific species of birds. That's a niche, people. <laughs> Now, the next one is to, if you want to get more people making things, and if you want to have more entrepreneurial mindset in your community, start a tool library. People can check out tools for woodworking or metalwork or sewing machines, or you can even set up culinary tools or kitchen equipment. Why not have a tool library for 3D printers or desktop laser etching or even compact machine tools? They make little desktop lathes and CNC kits now. Any kind of tool you can think of, this is a good way to get it into the hands of more creative people in your community. If you take that garage side space, sorry about the dog, and outfit them with a tool library of donated equipment people can share, you get a low budget makerspace. Now one makerspace like this is in Akron, Iowa. And it got started thanks to a group of retired fellas who drink coffee together each morning. The men had woodworking tools cluttering up their garages. They got together and moved their tools into an unused workspace in an empty building. And they call that workspace the Old Geezers Club, one of my favorites. They actually work with the local shop teacher and help students learn the craft of woodworking. And it's a great place for potential makers to try out the equipment without investing in a ton of money to do their project. 
And you can boost creativity while building community with co-crafting events like Crafter Noons, Hacker, or Maker Days. Once you start looking around, you'll see a lot of crafting and making events. North American Indigenous and New Canadian artists teach their skills in Crafter Noons events that are put on by the Mentoring Artists for Women's Art in Winnipeg. The church in Delta, British Columbia hosts a young adult craft noon, and Calgary, Alberta hosts Maker Fair, and it's this month. Now, much like the shared woodworking space, all kinds of artists and makers can benefit from having a shared space as well as shared equipment. The Artesian Gallery in Sulphur, Oklahoma is a project of the Chickasaw Nation. They took an empty building, they divided it up into individual studios for the artists to work in, they added a gallery space so they can set up exhibits. There's a classroom space to hold training and there's an art supply shop and they installed some shared equipment like a pottery kiln that any of the artists can access. Mark Mulligan with the Chickasaw Nation said his vision for this gallery is a collaborative co-working space for artists or maybe an arts incubator with artists meeting each other, trying new things and sharing ideas. Rose Williamson of the Crow Reservation Hannah is one example of the kind of local artist you could be growing through your crafternoons and shared workspaces. Rose started her beaded jewelry business from her home. She expanded into making clothing too, just like you see here, and that is Rose in the middle. She sells her jewelry, clothing, and beadwork at pop-ups at events around the state and online. Because Rose is known, she gets a lot of event invitations and she reaches out to other less well-known artists to come with her and exhibit their art. When you're looking for who would fill a shared art space or attend Crafternoons or use your maker space, start by looking at who already sells in booths and events and online. Those are your seed businesses to not only fill the space, but also to support and inspire people who could make their art or hobby into a tiny business. Now, another way to fill your shared spaces and support more startups, start with your student entrepreneurs. One terrific youth entrepreneurship program happens in Norfolk County, Ontario. They have a summer project for kids in grades six through 12 called the Student Startup Project or SUP. <laughs> kids can apply for real money to start a real business. They submit a very simple explanation of what businesses they want to start following an elementary level business plan template. Over the years, Norfolk County has offered anywhere from $50 to $200 in startup grants to those kids, depending on how much funding they have available. Now, the kids run their businesses all summer. And during the summer, Norfolk County holds a special marketplace event where the young entrepreneurs can feature their businesses in booths and displays. I'm sure people in the county look forward to that event every year. At the end of the summer, kids can earn a small cash bonus by turning in a final report that looks a lot like a simple profit and loss statement. Now, I will say that there was a question in the chat of whether there would be a recording available, and Kyle assures us this recording will be available. Um, and do remember that you can pick up the slides, and um, I'm going to throw that link back into the chat just so that you have uh, the photos in the headings to remind you of the different ideas that we shared, as well as I see people are like busy taking notes, those of you that are sharing video, and that is always motivating for us to know that you're finding practical ideas in what we're sharing. Um, and the funny thing is that it occurred to me as Heather was introducing us is like, who better to talk about cheap stuff than Becky and Deb, which <laughs> I take as a huge compliment because we are cheapos, right? Like if we can do it on the cheap, we are into that. So. Frugal, frugal. frugal. Yeah. Oh, we're frugal. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that was meant to be a compliment, just by the way. I did, where I come from, you know, being cheap is like a sport, like an Olympic sport. Like, how cheap are you? Oh, like, I'm cheaper. Like, it's like, oh, I got a better deal. So that was meant <laughs> absolutely as a compliment. And it was taken that way. Thank you, Ab. <laughs> it was. We were so cheap. So the idea of friendly method is actually a really cheap method, right? Like we were so cheap, we couldn't do like the 14 part thing with like the flow chart of decision tree and all of that. Like we only have three parts because that's all we could do. So um, we've given you some ideas to get your creative thinking going. But what we want to give you is our idea friendly method, because that gives you some structure so that you can make the most of these ideas or with any ideas you come up with from anywhere else. 
audience. So the idea friendly method is that you gather your crowd around your big idea. And then you build connections, like I mentioned, like the, the businesses built connections and that helped them to create new businesses in town. So you build connections to turn that crowd into a powerful network. And then your powerful network can take small steps to make things happen. So with the idea friendly method, you can take any idea, make it happen while building the strength and resilience in your community. And Emily says, we have been using the idea friendly method here in Mingo, Iowa. So I know Deb's excited to see the Iowa yeah, shout hi, out Mingo. There, Hi, so. Emily. Yeah. <laughs> So what we'll do now is we'll walk through how each part of that would work. Like what would, what would it look like if you were going to gather your crowd? Now this example comes from Pullman, Washington. And because I tell this story all the time, anytime I see someone sweeping their sidewalk, I always stop and take a picture. So this gal happens to be in Caldwell, Kansas. But anyway, in Pullman, Washington, they're a mountain town, right? Like they've got hills on one side. And so every time it rains, like stuff washes from the streets up onto their sidewalks. So there's leaves and dirt and stuff every time it rains. So when I first visited, I hate it when I do that. I go to scroll and then it messes with me. Put the mouse <laughs> cursor where it belongs. So when I first visited, they talked about, we really need to do another cleanup day. And like they tried to pin it on the Chamber of Commerce director. No one would volunteer to do it themselves, but they would volunteer other people. Finally, Willa, who is a business owner, she actually put up her hand and said, I'll clean my own sidewalk which she did. But how do we get from Willow cleaning her own sidewalk to like the whole downtown being cleaned up on an ongoing basis so we don't have to clean up days? Well, here's what, what Willow and the other business owners did. You take pictures when you do it and you clean your own sidewalk. You take pictures, you put it on social media and you hashtag it, clean your own sidewalk day. And then you invite everyone to join in and you make a big deal about how everybody can do their own sidewalk. It's clean your own sidewalk day. And someone is going to end up joining you. And that's what happened in Pullman. Other merchants followed Willow's lead. They started sweeping their sidewalks on Wednesdays and they were all inspired and having a great time. And then the city joined in. The city said, hey, that's great. Now they send around the street sweeping machine on Thursday in the early morning hours to clean up what they've swept off their sidewalks. And that is how you gather your crowd. Be conspicuous doing your thing in public invite other people to join you and make it really, really easy for them to join in. The next part of the idea friendly method is to build connections. So let's say the idea is to create more public art in town. We're going to need materials and the way we get materials is to build connections and network. So in Webster City, Iowa, my town, the mayor held a town cleanup weekend. It was a bit different. People actually brought their old things, garbage and no longer wanted items to a central location, the middle school for recycling or proper disposal. The volunteers helped unload cars and trucks and the mayor watched for any paint that was turned in that looked like it was still good. And he set that aside. The paint was later used in the Paint the Street project. For one day, the street was closed and each business that wanted to would pay $50 to paint any design they wanted in their section. Those funds raised went to support another arts event. And each year they paint over the designs with white paint and start over. And the mayor was able to kick this off by building connections to get that free usable paint at no cost, of course. <laughs> and the third part of the idea friendly method is to take small steps. So what are some cheap ideas to help you get going right away and learn from tiny mistakes? Well, let's stick with the idea of more public art downtown. Maybe we can't afford a big name mural artist, but we can take small steps. So let's make some murals with chalk. Start on the blank side of a building or fill in the space where you used to have a mural, but it flaked away. Or turn a blank retaining wall into a colorful spot and any blank surface is fair game. Just divide up the downtown, let lots of people create chalk murals in all the blank spaces. You know, after a couple of rains, it just washes away anyway. But before it does, it's going to generate a lot of interest and conversation around creating more art. Our next round of inexpensive or cheap ideas are all about downtown. Your downtown is the area of your community that everyone claims is their own. 
It's where you gather for events, eat with friends, and everyone wants to visit when they come back home. It is the heart of our towns. Many of our independent businesses are there and they support your community projects, your school sports, and they keep more of those profits in town. So it makes sense to bring people downtown, both visitors and locals. So let's look at some affordable ways to do just that. I'm going to start to encourage people to linger downtown by sharing your Wi-Fi. Now, the budget way to do this is just post a sign with the guest passwords of your own Wi-Fi and then ask downtown businesses to share their Wi-Fi with customers and visitors too. get more signs up so people know what's there. And this doesn't cost you a thing and it boosts the Wi-Fi that's available. Now, another big problem is it seems like every downtown needs more parking. And so we're gonna talk about one way to do that without breaking the budget. Now you probably have some parking near your downtown and you know maybe it's down an alley or it's like less than a block away. Now the inexpensive idea, make hallways so that customers can park around back, but they can walk to the storefronts with less effort. So you just wanna look for passageways between buildings. And these are incredibly common once you start looking for them where there's an empty lot or a green space that could serve as a path or a hallway. And then you put up the signs that direct people to that extra parking. And then they can and direct them where they are allowed to walk. Now, this particular hallway in the photo, this is a green space. It's next to and maintained by the bank in Kendrick, Idaho. They have a population around 500 people, but look at all that extra parking in the back there. And you can access it through this walkway. Just need some signs. And then in the winter, we want to encourage you to do some show to shovel some snow. Um, it seems like in every community, there are places that get missed by the city or that nobody else is taking care of it right now. So this is critical to help everyone, regardless of their mobility, continue to shop and get their services in your downtown and at your local businesses. So do it like Willow does with sweeping the sidewalks in Pullman become a movement that people can get behind, inspire other businesses to shovel their own sidewalks and improve access for everyone. Don't forget, you wanna remind people there's lots to do with a Pinterest board, like this one from the Stone's Throw Cafe in Alberta, and it's called What to Do in Crow's Nest Pass. Make it a group board and gather your crown through group pinning. It doesn't cost you any money to promote what you already have. You can also fix something broken on an empty building, like a loose board or a dangling wire. I mean, you can even wash the windows on empty buildings. This particular building in the photo was such an eyesore that at least three people mentioned it to me before I even arrived in that town. So after I suggested that, you know, they could just do a little ninja cleanup, then one city council member actually adopted those little, those sad flower boxes. She brought in some new happy looking plants and then she carried water to those plants all summer long. She told me that she, that this led to some really great conversations with people right there on the sidewalk while she was maintaining those flowers. You hang lights or put up solar lights. There is not a space in the world that can't be made better with some string lights. Put them in your pocket parks, on trees, on fences, over patio doors. Okay, now before someone asks you, let's talk about permission. When do you need it? And when should you ask for forgiveness instead? Well, when public safety is involved, always get permission. That includes ideas like painting your fire hydrants, crosswalks, bollards, like you see here, utility poles and utility boxes. I always hate to tell people they have to ask for permission for anything, but public safety, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that. But when it's something temporary, then just go ahead and do it. Chalk is so easy to wash off. Feel free to put chalk art on everything, everything. And if it's a public common, presume that you're part of the public. What we have seen in communities is we tend to overassume that we need permission when really it's a small town and most people are just going to appreciate the fact that you did something good. So go ahead and plant native wildflowers in that bare dirt if it's out in a common area. In Clark, South Dakota, um, Deb found out there was an older man who would walk around town and wherever he saw empty lots with just bare dirt, he would throw seeds for native wildflowers. <laughs> just 
everywhere, right? Like he didn't own those lots. He just put wildflowers out there and which is fine, right? Like, I don't think you want to let your Canadian nice stop you from doing things that are going to help the whole, the whole community. Okay. We're up to round three on ideas and we are a little more than halfway on our time. So if you've got questions or you want to, if you have seen an example of somebody that's doing something like this, um, or you want to bring anything up, the chat box is there for you and we will be glad to answer your questions or um, we'll see if we can make something up if you've got, if you've got one that stumps us, or if you've got a particularly thorny um, issue that you're like, well, I'm not sure how we're going to do this one thing. Feel free to throw that in there because we're going to, we're going to do our best to answer you. So um, in our next round of ideas, we're talking about opening this up to even more people participating. This is part of fairness and equity. Just let everyone play a role because everyone has gifts to share and everyone has some way they can play a role in your community. But we do know not everyone can participate in the exact same way. So what we have to do is we have to make the size of what we ask people do, to do match what they're capable of doing and what they're motivated to do. So this is, these next ideas are about breaking down the size of your ideas and the size of what you ask people to do. So we're gonna change the size of your ask. Now in any organization that you're part of, you can start by granting or giving smaller amounts. So for every, for every $1,000 grant you're gonna give, why not give 10 $100 grants instead? I mean, your budget is extra tight anyway, so this is the perfect time to be supporting those promising tiny ideas. And if you can't grant many, print certificates and give public recognition instead. Now we know you're resourceful people who take action because you're here, but you'll talk to some people who say they just don't have time for all of this. And I say, great, you can donate money. Dickinson, North Dakota has a group of 300 people who donate $100 a quarter to be used to better the whole community. Then the majority in attendance decide who to donate to. Spearfish, South Dakota, they have 100 women who donate $100 for similar crowdfunding projects. Luling, Texas, I love this. Their Chamber of Commerce invited people to bring just $20, then they all shop together at a local business. And that's called a cash mob. And it's really a great way to support a local business. Even smaller, our friend Katie Casian told us she has a group of friends in rural North Dakota who each give only $5. Then they use the group money to support a local business. Now they've helped a craft shop purchase an initial round of yarns and they've helped Stag Valley Homestead purchase some greenhouse items, $5. Okay, so we've got a really great question in the chat that we're gonna hold until we get through with this little section on breaking things up and getting people to donate in different ways. Um, so we've talked about donate your money, but if you can't donate money, donate your stuff, right? Like we all have too much stuff. So if people have an extra tool they no longer need, if it's still usable, can we put it in the tool library? Ask people to look in their shed and garage and see, do you have some paint that we could use? You've got some lumber. Is there other materials sitting around that would be useful in some of our projects around town? Encourage people to go out and look around in their garden. Do you have some plants that you can dig and divide for flower baskets for downtown? So lots of us have something that we can donate in the way of stuff. And if people can't donate stuff or money, maybe you can help them donate just a little time. Now you'll find people don't have time to serve on a multi-year committee, but they do have a couple of hours to help on a project for one day. So make sure you ask people for time spent doing, not meeting. Tony Henry, uh, Tony Henry from Pennsylvania told us this, our East Brady beautification group was having trouble getting people to meetings. I always said they came to eat cake and refreshments. But when asked if they could show up on another day to weed the park, they were busy. I assume they used up their only available hour meeting and eating cake. So I suggested that instead we meet at the park with our tools. And while we're weeding, we could meet. After weeding, we could all stop in at the Old Bank Deli for ice cream, supporting another local small business. And that seemed to work. And so, you know, East Brady is fewer than 1,000 people. Okay, so before we go into round uh, four, 
and adding some color. Let's deal with Lisa's question from the chat, which is, um, well, before that, Heather's got a comment on what we just talked about, donating time, doing, seems like a good way to get parents with young kids involved. If we're doing, I can bring my kids. If you're just meeting, then I'm gonna need childcare. Great point, kids can help with those flower beds. And think of ways that you can incorporate that no matter what your project is. So here's the question out of the chat. And Deb's gonna, use, Deb's gonna, Deb's got the answer for this one, I know she does. But how do we convince building owners to let the community use their empty buildings? Our town has very little commercial space available for lease, but a few for sale, which have been for sale for years. Deb's gonna say, wash the windows first. <laughs> Make it look really nice. Wash the windows first, sweep the sidewalks, maybe put a potted plant out in front. Uh, take some pictures, put it up on Facebook, and then somebody call that building owner and say, I love what you did to your building. What's coming? And this is the perfect opportunity to slide in and say, can we use this for an event? We're doing a gallery showing of a local artist, and we just need it for two weeks. You, you don't have to use the building all the time for all the things, but you can use it just for a pop-up or a gallery showing or a weekend event that you're already doing downtown don't hesitate to ask yeah we think they're going to say no and mm. that's not always true yeah we rehearse those conversations and we rehearse them saying no in our head so many times we think they've already said no when we haven't really asked them yet like I've done that but the story of the of washing the windows and then people contact the business building owner and go your building looks so much better true story that actually happened in Pullman Washington um, and the other thing is, you know, Deb mentioned a gallery showing of a local artist. Start with kids art, right? Like be ruthless about this. Start with, um, go find out what class the grandkids of this building owner are in. Get that class to make art. Bring the kids art down and show the grandparent and go, we need a building downtown to hang this kids art that we have from the fourth graders. Can we put this up in your building? Who's going to say no to their own grandkids, right? <laughs> Start with the, the obvious angles that you know you can get to. And then um, Morgan M., if, if I got that right, or maybe it's Morgan, um, who says, oh, it's Morag. All right, y'all will straighten me out our names here in a minute. Anyway, yeah, there you are. Hi, <laughs> Morag. Um, what about insurance issues in using those empty buildings? Now, I know you're asking this because people hit you with this, and it's normally because they just want to tell you no, and they just haven't got the guts to go ahead and just say no. So be aware that when they're saying, what about liability? They're usually saying no or trying to find a way to say no without actually saying no. So you slide around this. Deb, um, tell them how you got liability insurance for an event, which by the way, when she was at the ch chamber, they got an umbrella policy. You can do that. You can get an umbrella policy through your organization that'll cover a special event. Tell them how you, how you paid for it. Um, we were always looking for sponsors for things. And this is a perfect thing to sponsor the insurance to have people in this building and you make a big deal out of it so your local construction company made it possible to showcase these things in this empty building and hang and a banner for as, them and hang a banner for them and it's not as much as you think it's going to be and my question back to the owner that leads with this would be wait a minute you own the building you've got to have liability insurance i'm a little confused because they really do, do have to have insurance on the building. If they don't have their own, then like, why are they complaining? <laughs> it would be a really great question. But um, just see if you or your organization or a chamber or another organization in town that can sponsor the event can extend their coverage for not much money and find a sponsor. Okay. And work with your local insurance companies. That's the thing yes. I'll add on top of that. Yes. Absolutely. And that was part of your secret, Deb, is you went to a local person who was able yeah. to give you a good deal on it. So, see, we know, like, we are the cheap people. We know these things. So, <laughs> all right. Um, it is a valid issue. Yeah, it is a valid issue, but I'm saying I often hear it from somebody, right? Like, more times than not, that's what I hear it about, is somebody who's, like, trying to slide. It's a dodge for some people. <laughs> and it's not right. always the owner you hear it from. It could be, you know, the committee and negativity that, that has to pipe up and say something like that. Yeah, sometimes it's somebody that's like a third party. They're not the building owner. They're not the person involved in the event. They're just the person who tries 
to stop everything good. And so, you know, they're doing it as a dodge. So we have, but there are solutions when it's a real issue and then recognize when it's really not an issue. Okay, let's talk about color, right? Like we love color. Color is cheap. Color is a way. We all want to live in a place that's beautiful and happy. So let's make our communities more accessible, more beautiful, more involving for people, more pleasant for all of us locals. And long term, this is makes our places more attractive to visitors and outsiders too. Now, lots of towns, the more you look for this, the more you'll realize we've all got chain link fences in our downtown or along the major traffic routes. And there's just nothing going on there. It's not exactly very attractive, but this is a natural place to hang some art. Um, and you can, one way to, that you can do this, this was from Indianola, Iowa, and they are in Warren County and they're renovating their courthouse square. So like the entire courthouse building is gone. They're building a new one, the whole thing. So there's this giant hole in the middle of their downtown. Uh, so the county made the best of this very messy situation, they decorated the construction fencing with these beautiful, colorful banners that promote the county. And they opened it up for the to the community. So anybody could bring a banner or sponsor their own banners. And it's a multi-year building project. So they're going to continue to add more banners over time. And they're calling it Warren County Strong because they are, you know, reflecting the strength that they're showing through this tough time. And it's a lot more attractive than just blank chain link or the busy construction site. And once you get started looking for chain link, you're going to see it everywhere um, in secret, <laughs> cheap secret. Flowers and vines look really great in front of the chain link and distract you from either the chain link itself, especially if there's barbed wire on the top. I don't know why we have so much of that, but um, or if there's something behind it that you really don't want people to notice, then a bright sunflower or just some pretty uh, flowering vines up the chain link uh, will really help to distract people. We mentioned hallways or passageways that connect the front of your stores to more parking or more retail spaces in the back of your buildings. Well, the next step is to encourage businesses to make their alley entries more useful and attractive. Hutchinson, Minnesota had their main street, which is a major highway, being completely redone. The chamber worked with their stores to brighten up the back entrances to make them safer so customers could use the parking behind the stores. Webster City, Iowa has a big parking lot behind the stores and the retailers have been sprucing up their entrances and making the sidewalks behind the stores safer. And it also frees up the parking in the front of the stores. Now, if you have an old fashioned open staircase in your downtown, like the one in this small photo, why not paint a staircase mural? The decorated one is in a bookstore in Claremont, Oklahoma. And you can also search for Staircase Mural on Instagram or Pinterest for more inspiration. And you can do something similar on any set of steps, steps outside or inside. Deb, I actually saw an example of this out of Australia where they had painted um, words in English and then words in Aboriginal language and then um, like a pictogram of what the object was or what they were describing. So it was a really cool way to acknowledge the, pe the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people in Australia to help keep their language alive and to build this kind of unity and kind of like there's a steps theme there as well. So I thought it was a really cool project. Um, there's lots of these online. Oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Um, another thing that's everywhere are our flower pots and planters downtown. And if you look around, you'll realize there are always a few. Some business has some in front of them that they just don't take care of. Or there's a place, you know, there's some that aren't really in front of anyone. And so nobody is taking care of them. So let people and groups and encourage them to take over maintaining just one pot. Like, could you do just one pot for us, right? Like this is like sweep just your sidewalk, adopt just one pot. So that's gonna, you know, encourage some colorful plants. Um, Jenny, Amy, told us that they have stealth gardeners in Southampton, Ontario, who come out and water the potted plants that are sad and they pull out weeds and they spread some mulch. They work early mornings or late evenings. So nobody ever notices them because they're there outside of business hours. So they are the stealth gardeners. Um, and I wanna point out that planters don't have to be limited to flowers. What about some edible things? Can you do tomato plants or um, can you do some berries? What, what grows in your area? Uh, the town of Lumbee in British Columbia 
plants herbs in the pots on the downtown utility poles. You know, normally that'd be like petunias or something hard to maintain. Herbs are like indestructible. <laughs> they will live through anything. So they put those in the little pots on their utility poles and everyone is welcome to take some. And um, Jillian says our committee, Communities in Bloom Committee does this. We would love to have people like uh, spread this out and adopt it. And I, um, I have a new story that I want to share quickly, Becky, because I just heard it last night. One of the art studios painted a chair red and put it in the huge empty flower pot and it's beautiful. And when they're open, and they put their sign on it. Oh, I thought that was brilliant. So it like fills the large space. Yes, it's definitely. colorful. Yep, and it's a sign holder. <laughs> yes, that's a three for. All right. So El Emily <laughs> says they're looking for some more ideas for creative large planters. So they're doing two with fairy gardens. Now somebody's going to have a chair in one of them to use as a sign holder. I see that coming. <laughs> it's just going to happen. Gardens. Great idea. Great gardens do take space. So um, another thing, and this would actually kind of work with your big planters, but um, paint something that people will want to take a picture with, right? Like, which flowers is one thing. Um, Deb actually spotted this, like, are these, is that your nephew in the picture? No, but it's my friend Carrie and her grandson. <laughs> <laughs> and so happy they look. Okay. But, you know, you've seen murals that you want to pose in front of. And so if you're like, well, we can't really paint on the walls. You can chalk, right? Like you can chalk on the walls, or if you want something in between the durability of chalk that's going to wash right away or paint that's going to last forever, in between is to make something like this, like a signboard that's selfie worthy that you can bring out for events or that could lean up inside of a, um, a, a planter bed. Um, and uh, so you could do this on, you could do it on fabric, you could do it on cardboard, you can do it on wood, you can do it on whatever you can find for materials. Um, one other large planter idea that I saw was in Burnett, Texas, where they, the state flower is the blue bonnet. And so they have some huge 12 foot tall metal blue bonnets that sit in a flower bed. Because first of all, <laughs> they're giant people love them I, I may try to dig a picture up of that um but what's next oh deb your hashtag story tell them the hashtag story oh i love this story so do you want people to use your hashtags well you have to post them so you're going to be getting more people to promote your community and this when i visited paulding ohio there was this big sign painted on the wall of an empty building and it was advertising a business that wasn't even there anymore so before I left, we covered it up, me and this fella, by painting their favorite hashtag promoting the town. And no, we did not ask for permission. The building owner lived in China. Lots of people honked and cheered when they drove by, including the county sheriff. This was a good way to make more locals aware of the My Paulding hashtag. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, too. Dublin, Texas posts their most popular hashtags with little signs like this one posted at the airport. And they have these signs all around town. They have a lot of visitors and this is a great way to remind them to share photos and use your hashtags. This last idea is all about building community and creating better connections and understanding. Now you can create a listening post in an empty lot, two chairs and a sign encouraging people to just talk and listen to each other. We know community happens when people talk to each other. Okay, and with that, there's a question in the, in the chat. Lindsay asks, all right, so some of the people doing downtown beautification or cleanup also want to run people experiencing homelessness out of town. Take out the trash has become code for people. This is the saddest thing I've heard today. So how do we encourage volunteerism that is inclusive for all our community members? Um, so, <laughs> and I, there's a lot about this. Um, Talk for hours. I'd like I could, right? Like my first thing is like work on the homelessness problem, right? Like help people find solutions as well. Um, and the second thing is I'll go back to everyone has gifts to share. Um, I've think about the people who are experiencing homelessness and what are their gifts. And that sounds like it's really hard. You're like, they don't have anything. Then you're not meeting them and you're not, you're not finding out what gifts they have to share. There are people with amazing skills and talents who just don't have a place to live right now. Um, so start from that presumption and see if that does not 
help change the conversation a little bit of finding out that someone's a musician and they can play at an event or that someone's a good storyteller, or that someone could share their own story of their experience and help people change their perspectives. But a pr start from the presumption that everyone has gifts to share. Um, Please know that you can't, you can't be responsible for everybody, but you can help one person. And building community by talking to each other is one way to begin that. And for the person that's negative, and it's all gung-ho about taking out the trash, perhaps a conversation with that person and just keep digging. Uh, be kind and, and ask, where do you get that idea from? What, what about that works for you? And, and did you, where did you learn that? Because sometimes it's old leftover way of believing and we just carry those old ideas and we don't even really believe them until somebody points them out to us. Yeah, yeah. sometimes that does help. And you and got we... us all serious today. Hi, Nick. Now, Naomi says, we have new strict trespassing laws in Saskatchewan, so nobody better be trespassing on my place planting flowers or we're going to get up, right? Like, I seek some permission first. Okay, play this by ear in your community and play it by ear by the situation, right? Um, if ninjas sneak around at night and chalk something and make it look better, you might get away with it. We'll see, right? Like, but, but do what you've got to do. But remember that we tend to overthink it and tend to over ask for permission. And Ariel says, good idea for the council members to have that outdoor living room in the park, meet and greet, love it. Um, I want to share something else. I found the picture of the giant, um, uh, uh, the giant flowers, the giant um, blue bonnets. Here's the giant blue bonnets with my friend Sheila for scale. <laughs> So if you have a large flower bed, baby, put some large flowers. That's what we're saying. These are some all weather jewels. They happen to be in front of and near the Chamber of Commerce. Notice they painted the windows to kind of go along with the theme here, which I think is great. Um, people in Western Canada do love a large statue. <laughs> Look, they put a big rock in there. Like we don't even have enough grass. Like there's a big rock, there's a little gazebo, right? Like you can get creative here. So I had to show you that one. And thanks to Sheila Scarborough for posing for my photo <laughs> with the giant blue bonnets, which was a, a, a great thing from her. Um, I will say livability is part of economic development. Um, if you have more questions that we haven't gotten to, I do wanna say, um, please send those to us. Um, you, Heather can send those questions to us and we will be glad to answer your questions. And we have a gift for you. We're running out of time. Um, but I do want to say we have a free gift for you, which is that we've talked a lot about lowering the barriers to entry, specifically for business and economic development. And we want to give everyone a fair chance. And so I'm going to throw this link into the chat box as well. Um, we do special rural videos throughout the year at Savior.town. Our latest video shows you practical steps to incorporate into your economic development plans and projects. So um, I've thrown the link there into the chat. It's also in your PDF handout if you got the PDF. And if you'll find out ways to lower barriers to entry, like the ones that we shared today, like the little tiny houses and stuff like that. And this video is less than 30 minutes long and designed for you to share with others in your organization. I would like to take a moment to thank everybody for being here today. Um, again, I'm Deb Brown from Iowa. And I'm Becky McRae from Oklahoma. Thank you so much for help, having us join you today. Thank you so much for that presentation. I know that a lot of the ideas were coming so quick. Um, and so you definitely want to check out the recording um, afterwards. I'm going to send out a link to everyone who uh, signed up for the webinar with the recording, but it's also just at cooperativesource.com slash webinars. Um, and of course, there's that uh, copy and paste that into a browser somewhere, the link that they sent about, you know, the ideas, budget ideas. And um, I can't say enough good about um, what Deb and Becky have to offer. I think one of the, the reasons I sort of presume that, okay, you're the, you know, queen's the cheap, I guess, is, um, you know, you're okay with that. You know, it's really about um, ease of use, um, because the suggestions are just something I think, oh, I could do that, or I could do that, or what about that, or what if I just drew a chalk mural or painted something or put some flat, you know, what? why not, right? Um, so that's, 
that's I think where my head went to is that it's really so doable um, because every one of your examples, someone's already done. This isn't a hypothetical. These are all been done, tested ideas. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, yeah, and far as uh, any additional questions, lingering something that you really thought you should have asked and didn't get to or didn't think of at the time, please feel free to send me, your, send me an email and I can send to Deb and Becky. Um, you should all have my email from the uh, communications about the event. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. I host webinars kind of once a month sort of thing. Our next one, um, actually, we're going to do a contest with um, the contest is going to be um, it's a little tongue in cheek. It's going to be show us your assets. So we're asking people across Western okay. Canada to show us like what they got. Um, and no like bum picks, please, please don't. Oh, that was on the recording. Okay. But the point of it is just to be like, show us your natural resources what you've got you know we all work best when we play to our angle our best angles right so it's just about seeing what you got going what's your you got mountains you got lakes you got rivers you got a, a weird hole you know um, you found the big world's biggest t-rex that's you know that that's the thing in saskatchewan right so what what do you got right um, I'm feeling so that. I just want you to know. You feel it? So okay. Well, it's time yeah. to post. I'll show you. It, it's going to be. It's going to be fun. There's going to be prizes. I think the prizes are only for open for people in Western Canada, but anyone can participate. Um, and uh, yes, like Instagram, Facebook, whatever. So we're kicking off the Show Us Your Assets contest with a webinar on finding your tourism assets because we really want to talk about getting outdoors capitalizing on what's going on with tourism right now i mean people want to get out places i know that because i want to get out places um so people want to travel um people are feeling cooped up so they want to get outside they feel safer outside so you know feel identify those tourism assets and put something together everybody has something unique every town every community every region so first you have to know what you have and then you have to capitalize on those things by putting them together right so package them up. So we're going to talk about finding your edge and packaging it up. Um, okay, yeah, some people are messaging me. Yeah, so I'm going to announce that contest, like it's starting June 15th. Um, so I'll be sending stuff out to partners, um, if people are wondering, like maybe the first week of June. Um, and I will send graphics and things you can share on your social media if you want to be one of our promoters. I would love that. Um, really excited about it. And, I, you know, like keep it clean. That's the only <laughs> People it's like okay keep it clean um but i think people get where i'm going with it right so um anyways thank you so much deb and becky for joining us for all of these wonderful ideas i love it i'm so inspired to go um do some amazing things um in the places that i live and work and play and um and i hope everyone else is to um share with your network share the video um and if you want to join us again, go to cooperativesfirst.com slash webinars and join us for another webinar. And so we'd love to see you again. So thank you so much for joining. Have an amazing Wednesday.